Cairo, Seattle. Bell, and this is Your Last Meal, a show about famous people and the stories behind the foods they love most. Today on the program, the last meal of singer-songwriter Nikki Bloom. Nikki Bloom is one of my all-time favorite singers, and for years she performed with her band The Gramblers, but she's recently gone solo. But when the Gramblers did tour together, they often sardined five people into a van, and to combat long-distance driving boredom, they recorded what they called van sessions. So they would mount a camera to the windshield and play cover songs while they were driving from city to city. Just kind of like a campfire sing-along that we get to watch on YouTube. Their version of Hall & Oates' I Can't Go For That has nearly 3.5 million views on YouTube. I met up with Nikki in the green room at the Neptune Theater in Seattle when she was touring with Josh Ritter. Let me just check your... Hey, 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 hi, 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 hi. hi. Okay. All right, levels checked. Let's do this. One of the things you were known for was the van sessions, and you were for years traveling the country so many days on the road in a van with a million dudes. How does it feel now to not have a car full of dudes? You're just doing your own thing. It's pretty awesome. I mean, I miss the dudes. I love the dudes, but it's um, like gas stops take like a fraction of the time and you can sleep later and we're, you know, in like a more comfortable vehicle, just just me and and my um, sound engineer. And uh, it's pretty sweet. I love it. So on the note of gas stations, you have probably stopped at a thousand. What is the good food at the gas station? Like when you're trying to eat something good when you're traveling, what do you go for? Well, it depends. I mean, I like to go to Love's. I think that they have like the best selection if you're going to be at a gas station. Plus they have really cute stuffed animals and stuff. You know, I'll go for like the raw almonds or bananas or I'm always looking for like the potato baked lays. I'm kind of like, I try to be like healthy, Um, but really it's the best. Like we've been on the West Coast a, a lot in California and there's like the produce stands and there's like the little, you know, farm stand markets. And that's really the great one to find. But it gets harder as you get into the food desert, which is basically middle America. Once we leave the coast, that's what we start to enter into. So... And from traveling around the country, do you have favorite places that you pop into when you're in a certain city that places you love to eat? Yes, for sure. Well, today, where did we go? We got those Cuban sandwiches at Paseo. Mm -hmm. And um, yesterday in in Portland, we were at Porque No. Just like classic San Diego burrito, drive through style. Like those are things you can't get. I, I live in Nashville now. And... Finding really good Mexican food is hard to go to. We drove through Texas, got some really great barbecue. We were in El Paso and got just, like, rad queso. Just trying to eat, like, as locally as we can, specialized stuff. What's the best thing about touring and what's the worst thing about touring? Best thing about touring is definitely getting to just travel and see the landscapes. I mean, it's just such a great reminder of what a beautiful country we live in and the drive from uh, Sacramento to Sisters, Oregon, we did a couple days ago, was just stunning. I mean, you forget, like, how beautiful this place is, especially if you live in a city or you don't get out much or you don't get to the more wild parts of it. It's really easy to forget that there is so much open space and how important it is to, like, stay connected to that and protect it and preserve it and remember that, it's like so essential to our existence as humans worst part probably not getting to sleep in your own bed you know I miss my bed when I'm gone sometimes you score like rad beds and other times not so much what would your last meal be we were talking about this in the car today actually I realized I'm kind of a big steakhouse person The most kind of like classic and delicious meal for me would be like sitting down to a petite filet, medium rare. It's like kind of crispy on the outside and like 
buttery on the inside and maybe a side of creamed spinach and like scalloped potatoes and a nice glass of Cabernet and cheesecake. You're like a little Frank Sinatra. <laughs> Well, both my parents are from New York, and my grandfather loved Frank Sinatra. In fact, he used to, um, like, we would sit down to dinner at their house, and he'd put Frank Sinatra on, but then it would be, like, his voice overdubbed, kind of, like, singing over it. Your grandpa's voice? Yeah, it was my grandpa's voice. So I think Wait, but like it recorded? Early ingrained. Yeah, he'd be sitting at the table there with you, and he was really into, like, old radios and television and technology, and so he always, like, was futzing around in his basement, like, doing that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I think that's kind of in my blood, that whole Rat Pack vibe. So your grandpa, like, had recorded his own voice over it, and then he's playing that, and then he's also just sitting at the table. Yes. Okay. Yes. He's, it's like he's duetting with Frank Sinatra, and he's in the room. But I don't remember ever anybody thinking it was like weird or even commenting on it. Mm-hmm. But I picked up on it, and I thought it was genius. So your grandpa must have been a good singer, too. No, terrible. Oh. Yeah. Mm-mm. <laughs> Not good at all, but spirited, you know? Yeah. Sometimes that makes up for a technique is just like your zest for it. And I feel like with someone like Frank Sinatra, you can almost do an impression, and doing impressions is easier than trying to pull off good singing. That's a very good point. Yeah, I think that was his angle. Hmm. Yeah. So would you eat this kind of steakhouse dinner at your grandparents' house? Would they make something like that? Or where did you acquire this love? Yeah, um, I think that maybe it's something around like Christmas time. Like we would get sent these like Kansas City steaks, and it was like really special, and we would make it like a special thing. I don't know. Steakhouses were always kind of where we went for, like, special occasions. Still do. My parents still, like, go to Morton's on their anniversary. And, you know, it's just I kind of like getting to choose things a la carte. And I don't know. It just kind of has that throwback feel, which is nice. And I, I really like to drink wine, so it goes well with that. What is your favorite steakhouse? My favorite steakhouse? Um, the first one that comes to mind is the Buckeye Roadhouse in... Mill Valley, California. It's kind of a classy joint, and it's like feels very festive, especially around the holidays, which just adds to that whole like cozy fireplace vibe. This is the 37th episode of Your Last Meal, and Nikki is the fourth guest to choose steak, making it the most popular last meal in Your Last Meal history. This is something I did not anticipate when I started this podcast, that there would be repeats. Uh, Darcy Carden, who plays Janet on The Good Place, she wanted a steakhouse dinner. Kevin Allison, host of Risk and formerly of MTV's The State, he is a vegan and he wanted a steakhouse dinner. And talk show host Tom Likas also wanted steak. Now, when I was trying to put together this episode, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to talk about. Four people now want steak. And then I realized that I've actually never talked about the history of the steakhouse. So the history of the steakhouse right after this break. Nikki loves the steak at the Buckeye Roadhouse in Mill Valley, California, which opened in 1937, which when I read that seemed pretty old. But then I started looking at the history of steakhouses and those go back way farther than 1937. So the country's very first steakhouse opened in 1868 in New York City's Meatpacking District. And it is still open today. You can have dinner at the country's first steakhouse. It's called the Old Homestead Steakhouse. It opened just after the Civil War, which just sounds really weird and old, especially for a very young country like ours. Uh, But if you look at the menu, you can see that they have definitely modernized. So of course, they have classic steaks, but... I, I, I don't think that Civil War vets were celebrating their anniversaries with Florida rock shrimp tempura with wasabi aioli. But the classic American steakhouse spawned from a couple of different things, both from New York City. The first is what was called a beefsteak banquet. So this was an all-male, all-you-can-eat fundraiser event where chunks of beef were served on slices of white bread. But the bread was kind of used more as a plate. Most people didn't eat the bread. So at the end of the night, you would show what a strong beefcake of a man you were by counting up your slices of bread to brag about how much beef you ate. 
Okay, so that's the beefsteak banquet. The other thing that spawned the steakhouse is what was called a chop house. And these were in New York City in the mid-1800s. They were modeled after British chop houses. And you could order beef, mutton, kidneys, and bacon. These were dark, dusty, dank kind of pub-like settings. And you would get a baked potato on the side, and you would drink a lot of beer. But then New York City's meatpacking district started producing high-quality steaks, and the steakhouse was born. And the old Homestead Steakhouse is not the only old school institution that is still open. You've probably heard of Peter Luger's. I had no idea that they've been open since 1887. And then there is Keene's Steakhouse, which opened in 1885, both still open in New York. And while I'm pretty sure these restaurants were not originally serving beef carpaccio with black truffle oil, aged Parmesan, and microgreens, for the most part, steakhouse menus are pretty true to the original menus. They've always served hash brown potatoes, creamed spinach, and cheesecake, which is almost exactly what Nikki wants for her last meal. The sides were actually latecomers as well. It used to be just beef, and then the meat started getting expensive, so they needed to fill you up with some sides. So that is where the side dishes came from. The meat got smaller, and your baked potato got bigger. But just like on Thanksgiving, a lot of us can argue that sides are really the best part. So I did a little sleuthing about Nikki's eating habits before our interview, and based on that knowledge, I was floored when she said she wanted a steak for her last meal. It is very out of character. So when we come back, Nikki talks about her daily diet, a specialized food plan that goes back 5,000 years. Nikki Bloom wanted a classic steakhouse dinner for her last meal. A medium rare petite filet, cream spinach, scalloped potatoes, cabernet, and cheesecake. But this is really out of character compared to how she eats most of the year. We have a friend in common. We'll just do a little shout out. Hi, Molly. Um, And so I'm so interested in your choice because I text her and was like, okay, tell me some things that Nikki likes because then I can, you know, ask her questions. And then she messaged back and said that you're into Ayurvedic food yeah (laughs) which is totally the other way I mean that's what I eat all the time like there's a dish called kitchari which is Ayurvedic so Ayurveda the oldest form of Indian medicine and within that are certain recipes that are super clean and all vegetarian so I typically eat vegetarian but you know, this was my last meal. So if I eat kitchri every single day of my life, which I basically do when I'm home, I was going big on my last meal. What's kitchri? Kitchri is kind of like a stew. So it's um, split mung dal beans, jasmine rice, and then just tons of Indian spices. So basically the whole kit and caboodle of, of spices. And then you can put in any vegetable you want. And then you add like a little ghee and salt and pepper, avocado, cilantro, squeeze li- lime on it. It's really good. Mm. Yeah. Can you explain a little what Ayurvedic, am I saying that right? Yeah. Ayurved- I always have read it and I've never said it before. This is so new to me. Yeah. Um, can you explain it's what, it is Ayurvedic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> can you explain what it is for people who don't know? Yeah, so, um, It's basically, like I said, it's a very old form of Indian medicine, and it's based off of your three doshas. So you take a test of a series of questions, and you figure out your dosha. And it's, you know, you're either pitta, vata, or kapha, or your combination of the two. Um, And, you know, I'm vata, so... You can look at the characteristics of that, which is like very dry and lean and long and, you know, I'm very tall and and I have like small bones and I, my skin tends to be dry. So like, because I am dry, I need a lot of like moisture. So I need to eat like oily foods as opposed to like brittle dry chips and things like that, which is like why I have avocados on my writer. You know, I get an overabundance of vata traveling all the time because constantly going, wind, motion. And so to balance that, I need to find ways to ground. Warming teas, warming spices, meditating. So it's basically just kind of figuring out how to balance your life. 
because the belief is that if you can find balance, you can stay clear of disease and illness and you know, not just physical, but emotional, mental too. Um, so it's kind of like a holistic approach to health. Have you noticed a big difference since you started eating that way? You know, I notice the biggest difference when I go for a, a, a elongated period of time where I am like really eating that way, eating really clean. Um, and when I do that for a period of time, when I'm home or when I'm like on a retreat or something, I'll really notice it. Just my digestion gets really good and I feel really good. I have energy. So it, it's, it's really kind of fascinating. It's very complicated. I'm just giving you like a really, really simplified version of the way I understand it. But you could, I mean, people have studied it for lifetimes. But it's a hard thing to do on the road. I tried to make Kitchery on the road when I was in a bus once and my band was gonna kill me because not everybody likes the smell of Indian food, turns out. <laughs> yeah, how did you learn about it? Did you just read or do you have like a Sherpa to kind of show you the way? Yeah, my really dear friend, Eliza Kerr, she um, has a company um, up in Yosemite, right outside the West Gate of Yosemite. A balanced rock is the name and she takes women out on like backpacks and um, guided tours and that's how I started working with her we were on a backpacking trip and she just started talking to me about it I think I was talking to her maybe about some stress or anxiety that I was having and she was like oh well you should learn some stuff about Ayurveda and I was like what's that this was when I this was like eight years ago and she um, directed me to Deepak Chopra's Perfect Health. And that was a great book to like introduce myself to it. So in the back is a questionnaire so you can go through and you can figure out your dosha. And then I got really interested in it and it started making sense to me. And that's when I went in and I had a consultation with her. And she's kind of become my Ayurvedic practitioner. And I'll go see her a couple times a year. And you can do go through, you know, it's recommended in the se- change of the seasons that you do something called panchakarma, which is you go in and you basically cleanse your system internally, mentally, physically. And it's just a really nice reset to ground. And I mean, I could use it right now. I really could use it right now. <laughs> so is that like a fast? No, it's not a fast. Essentially, you eat kitchery only, but you eliminate caffeine and alcohol and all those things Um, and then you go in for a series of treatments it's basically like massage and steam and something called shirodara which is just like a steady stream oil drip on your forehead which just for me it completely like makes me I've never done heroin but it's what I would imagine it would feel like it's just like you're completely out of body and it's just like feels amazing and you're not really in your body anymore Hippie heroin. It's hippie heroin. Yeah. 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 Did you grow up eating any of, I don't know, I don't want to keep saying the word hippie, but kind of like a more pure way? Is this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, my dad thinks I'm crazy. Like, my dad's, you know, first generation Italian. He only eats Italian food and American food and Italian American food. And no, no, I wasn't raised at all being like that. I think when when I started being on the road a lot, started having some like just digestive issues you know it's hard being out in the world and eating all kinds of different stuff especially like I said when you're in the food desert and there's not a whole lot for you to eat so um I just kind of have started eating things that make me feel good with certain exceptions you know sometimes it's worth it to get a belly ache because it just tastes so good I know just hearing Nikki talk about Ayurvedic eating was so fascinating to me I'd seen the word. I never truly understood what it was, but was instantly fascinated and started thinking that I wanted to eat this way too, which makes no sense because I eat nachos and pizza and ramen, but it sounds good. It sounds like a nice way of eating. So I invited Jody Boone to the studio. Jody is an Ayurvedic therapist and wellness counselor who spent several years living and studying in India. Now she practices in Seattle, where she's also a yoga teacher. <clears throat> she's actually my yoga teacher. Just for me, it's fun to have you in because I tell my friends this all the time. I want to know what my teachers wear because it's like (laughs) 
it's like this really intimate thing taking a yoga class. And I'm like, I don't know what they wear. I don't know what they're like out of class. It's just right. like yoga pants and totally. serenity. Yeah. So now I know <laughs> Jody Boone wears sweaters. <laughs> yeah. It's out there now. Yeah. Yeah. Jody explains the basic concept of Ayurveda. Staying in balance is the most important thing because in Ayurveda, it's believed that the root cause of all disease is coming out of balance. And so there are these three energies or doshas, uh, vata, pitta, and kapha. And the vata energy is made up of air and space. And pitta is fire and water. And kapha is earth and water. And so each of us has a unique makeup or a unique combination of these three energies. And Ayurveda says there are three pillars to life. There's diet, sleep, and right use of energy. And so when you meet, for example, with an Ayurvedic practitioner, an Ayurvedic doctor, they really want to know you intimately. Your first visit could take up to two or three hours with them just asking, how are you? What is your work-life balance like? How do you feel physically? How do you feel mentally? And in Ayurveda, it's said that if the mind is out of balance, the body's out of balance, and vice versa. The mind and the body are seen as one and the same. And we always look first at someone's diet. And it's said that if diet is right, medicine is of no need. And if diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. And so the kitchen is seen also as the pharmacy. That's where we always begin before herbs or other recommendations is food. And the body is seen as its own healer. So once you can bring food into balance and then right sleep and right use of energy, and I'll just define right use of energy, that would be, you know, do you feel like you have a life purpose? Things you do in life feel meaningful. So this is very deep. Yes. <laughs> so do you work to kind of get there? Yeah. So during a consultation with someone, you can really uncover a lot. And it's amazing once people start to feel feel balanced in one way or another. Uh, For example, when they start eating right diet, which is determined by their Ayurvedic constitution, their unique uh, blend of vata, pitta, and kapha energies, it's like a mirror, and they start looking at other aspects of their life too. And so people will really examine their work. Is it meaningful? Do they look forward to going every day, or is it something they dread? And even their most intimate relationships, the people they're closest to, um, does it give you energy? Is it inspiring spending time you know, with this person or that person? Or does it bring you down in some way? And so we're always trying to find that balance. Jody gives an example of the way someone with a vata constitution would eat. If your constitution is predominantly vata, you're a person who has a lot of air and space. So you might be someone who cannot stay focused on one task for very long. You'll be interested in one thing for a little while and then quickly switch. Uh, Maybe you'll be going into the next room to look for something and then you suddenly forget, what was I looking for? Um, Vatas uh, have a nature where they tend to worry about things. They experience a lot of anxiety. Uh, And because they're made of air and space, they tend to be light. These are people who have a difficult time gaining weight, difficult time often with sleep, difficult time to digesting food. They're more prone to for example, to gas, bloating, constipation. So how we nourish a vata person is through foods that are really moist and really warm. Vatas tend to also be very cold and very dry. And so we nourish from the inside out. And so what that would look like would be one-pot meals like soups and stews. And because they're made of air and space, vatas can be quite spacey too uh, and quite forgetful. So we want to ground them uh, with root vegetables Uh, like carrots and beets and yams and things like this. And so they're quite light, and so we want to bring in heavy foods, but it can't be too heavy because their digestion is very, yeah, susceptible to going out of balance. And so if we make it warm and also moist and we spice it in the right way with nice warming spices, it'll be easy to digest. And Ayurveda also says that you should only eat food that is made by you or someone who loves you very much. And so, of course, in our culture, we eat a lot on the run and a lot to go and sort of prepackaged food. So with Ayurveda, there's definitely a commitment to 
cooking whole foods. And there are easy ways to do that. It doesn't take a lot of time, actually, and people are surprised. So how- for you, I'm assuming you eat this way. Yes, most of the time. Well, I was going to say, does that mean that you don't eat in restaurants? No, for sure. I eat in restaurants. And so, yeah, and so Ayurveda is also really realistic. And this is modern life, and it's it's fun to go out to eat, for example, too. And so as much as possible, trying to stay in balance. But what Ayurveda says, you know, the moment you notice you're going out of balance, really try to adhere to the Ayurvedic diet that's appropriate for your constitution. Oh, I love Jody's voice. It is so soothing. I feel like she could narrate those ASMR videos. So let's hear her talk about French fries and fall into a deep and beautiful sleep. Is there anything that you crave that is outside of this diet that after all these years of eating this way, it's like your thing that you just have to have sometimes? Yeah, you know, I really love French fries. And so I'll definitely treat myself to some French fries sometimes. So are you not supposed to have the oily for what your constitution yeah, is? exactly. And um, potatoes are not really recommended in Ayurveda. You can have a sweet potato or a yam. This is recommended, but because of what potatoes can do to the blood sugar. It's not, the white potatoes are not recommended. So it's definitely a treat and definitely a splurge. I feel like I just had a therapy session. (laughs) I'm thinking of everything you're saying. I'm going to do this. I'm going to try this. This is really beautiful. Thank you so much for coming in, Jody. Thanks so much, Rachel. I love this. I actually want to come in now to Bastyr and and be be analyzed. I actually made an appointment with Jody immediately after our interview. Suddenly I'm an Ayurvedic convert. It just, the whole thing makes sense to me to eat for your body type, to eat for your brain type. Uh, And I think in general, Americans tend to think that things like Ayurveda is super woo woo and hippie, but it's just, it just sounds like it makes sense. Like if you're cold, eat something hot. Like why are we so weird about this stuff? And I don't know if I'll be able to stick to an Ayurvedic diet. I don't see myself eating mung beans and jasmine rice every day for the long haul. But maybe after I go see Jody Boone and I shift my diet in small ways, I'll become a convert. A regular old Nikki Bloom, who, by the way, also has the sweetest voice. Thanks, Nikki Bloom. Thank you, Rachel. And that was Nikki Bloom's last meal. Starting in April, Nikki will be touring with the Wood Brothers. You can find her tour schedule. You can buy an album. You can sample some tunes at NikkiBloom.com. It's Nikki with an I, B-L-U-H-M. And please don't forget that actually buying music lets artists continue to be artists. So you can get one of her records for the same price as a craft cocktail. It's very worth it. I have all of her stuff on vinyl, and you can too. Ding! Thanks to Jody Boone. You can link up with her at jodyboone.com. That is Jody with an I, just like Nikki. Jody is teaching a yoga retreat on a Greek island this summer. I saw the pictures. You should probably go. This episode is produced by Aaron Mason and me. Our theme music, as always, is by Prom Queen. And if you like the show, leave a review. We say this every week, and I'm sure every week you're like, "Eh, I will do it. Do it now. Don't procrastinate. I'm a procrastinator too, but leaving a review helps the show. And I know you want to help the show. I'm Rachel Bell, and this is Your Last Meal.